And we now move on to questions to the Minister of Employment and Learning. And questions 5, 6, 7 and 9 have been withdrawn. And I call Lord Morrow. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Question number 1. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, with your permission, I wish to group questions 1 and 14 and would like to request an additional minute for the answer. In addition to provision for those with learning difficulties, many students are able to participate in the full range of mainstream provision with additional support provided by colleges and assisted by my department's additional support fund, which provides $2.5 million per annum to help provide technical and personal support. The fund also provides an additional $2 million per annum to help colleges facilitate tailored discrete programmes for students unable to access mainstream provision due to the nature or degree of their learning difficulty. This fund was recently increased by £1 million per annum to ensure all students with the ability to participate in further education provision receive the additional support required to help them to do so. In 2013 and 14, over 3,500 students were supported through the fund, of which over 2,000 were aged 19 and over. The aim of college provision and the additional support fund is to enable access and provide support to these students to help them meet their individual goals through further education and progress towards employment or, in some cases, independent living. Colleges maintain close contact with local schools and related professionals to ensure that provision is relevant and appropriate to the needs of the potential students and also to ensure that all students are aware of the opportunities available in further education. My department's Training for Success programme is also delivered within further education colleges. This programme offers participants the opportunity to gain relevant work experience, professional and technical skills, as well as the personal and behavioural skills required to progress into employment in their chosen field. Participants with learning difficulties or disabilities receive a range of additional support from colleges and external support suppliers contracted by my department. My department's career service has a partnership agreement in place with post-primary schools, including special schools, to support the school's careers education programme. Careers advisors play an active role in the transition planning process of young people and adults by providing impartial careers guidance on the range of opportunities available to them, including further education. Following concerns about transitions to adult provision for young people with severe learning disabilities, my department undertook a range of actions aimed at improving our provision. I also raised the issue with the Bamford Interministerial Group on Mental Health and Learning Disability, which agreed my department would lead a cross-departmental uh, group of officials to consider current gaps in provision. This group will discuss progress on the work undertaken by officials at its next meeting on the 13th of May. And could I, before I call for supplementary, could I just correct my information about the uh, questions that were withdrawn? Uh, the Minister will recognise questions that he intends to group. Uh, the, the correct questions that were withdrawn are 8, 10 and 11. And could I call Lord Morrow for supplement? Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his very comprehensive and full reply. And I look forward to getting Hansard answer tomorrow to just go through that uh, reply again, because it, it was quite lengthy. But I, I thank him for it. Uh, what I want to ask the Minister in relation to my supplementary is, I have a concern uh, about this whole issue, but in particular in places such as Fermanagh South Tyrone. And can the Minister assure us today that there has been, and he will ensure that there is an equal distribution of places right across all the colleges, the further education colleges, and in particular in Fermanagh South Tyrone? Well, I, I'm happy to, to, to say to, to, to the member that is certainly um, our, our intention. Um, whether we're going to be able to achieve it in practice, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little le less certain. Um, one of the things we have uh, undertaken, uh, and the member will be aware of this, is an audit or provision across the, 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 the colleges. Um, it is up to the colleges themselves to organise provision uh, within um, the, the various campuses that they have uh, and to ensure that there is an appropriate balance. We will not always have a situation where there is uh, an equal distribution of courses across, particularly in, in this very, very particular area, across all of the colleges uh, th themselves. The member will also be acutely aware that, um, particularly in, in light of the consistency he represents, that uh, geography and distance com comes into play, and often uh, young people uh, will 
will have to travel some distance to access our colleges, and that's why the issue of transport is, 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 a, is an issue of, of particular importance. And one of the aspects that is uh, receiving particular attention in terms of the interministerial group is what work we can do around transport issues, uh, especially trying to highlight the, the opportunities that do exist and providing support for people uh, to ensure that they can access uh, the, the courses that are available across the different uh, campuses of colleges. Ms. Paula Bradley. Mr. Or Mr. Speaker, and can I also thank the Minister for his very comprehensive answer. Um, in my question, I have been looking at full-time employment as well. And we all know that all of our children are different, whether they have a learning difficulty or not. Some go on to further education, others that is not what they want to do. And I just want to wonder, would the Minister agree that there is a role within the public sector? I know some councils and other public sectors um, actually have various schemes um, that, that, that are, are open for, for our children with learning difficulties. Does he believe that there is a role for that and that should it be more uniform? I, I certainly would concur um, with the member's sentiment that uh, we should be encouraging uh, all businesses uh, and uh, organisations, including the public sector, uh, to open up um, work placements in this regard and also to ensure that they are progressive employers in terms of offering uh, permanent uh, positions. The member may also be interested to know that we are, are close to finalising uh, for public consultation a, a draft uh, disability employment and skills uh, strategy. This will cover all aspects of the work of my department in terms of supporting people with, with disabilities with a particular um, focus on trying to ensure that we are able to facilitate people into work and to support people in work and people with learning disabilities are clearly a, a, a major client group within the existing disability employment service and will be something we have very much at the heart uh, of the emerging strategy. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, have you ruled out the possibility of other partner organisations uh, delivering these courses or will it be the sole uh, responsibility of the Northern Ireland Colleges Network? Well, the provision, uh, particularly with respect uh, to uh, disability issues, uh, is shared uh, between uh, our colleges, but also the community and uh, voluntary sector. And without jumping too far ahead, um, the, the disability is, is a key uh, aspect that is supported uh, through the European uh, Social Fund. And recently, we've made announcements in that regard and included a, a considerable number of, of organisations working uh, within the disability sector. So, across the, both the, the, the further education provision and what the community voluntary sector does, albeit uh, with, with different focus in different geographical areas, we are looking to get a, a strong coverage. Uh, but it does require partnership, and it is, does involve work beyond just the statutory sector. Ms. I thank the Minister for his responses so far. Minister, would you give consideration to operating a pilot scheme under the economic inactivity strategy uh, within Fermanagh South Tyrone to address the barriers um, of those people with disabilities who want to go into employment? Well, certainly the, the emerging economic inactivity strategy um, would be open to facilitating uh, that, that type of intervention. At this particular point in time, I can't give a guarantee that a particular type of project will be occurring in a particular geographical area. We are looking uh, to a series of competitive pilots uh, to test different types of interventions, and then we will see how we can upscale those. And uh, given the nature of that competitive piloting process, we will be looking for a number of small-scale and, and geographically focused uh, interventions. So, what the member is, is uh, suggesting uh, is certainly consistent with, with the strategy. But once we actually go for op open calls uh, to, uh, to the community and voluntary sector and, the, and indeed others, uh, we will see if such projects can come forward and then decisions will have to be made on which ones we're going to resource. Uh, and obviously, the available resources uh, uh, that are put on the table will be a key factor in terms of how far we can go in terms of supporting different types of, of, uh, of interventions for testing. Danny Kinahan. Mr. Speaker, my original question was to ask the Minister whether he felt that the current transition process is fit for purpose and delivered to the same standard. And you seem to have a mass of changes that are coming in, which is, is excellent, but will he guarantee that that is where you're trying to move to, so that we have a transition process that's fit for purpose and delivered to the same standard across the whole of Northern Ireland? Yeah. Well, first of all, I could just put on record my congratulations to the member on his uh, election uh, to, 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 to Parliament uh, la last week. And also to say to him that the, the question he asked is, is, is perfectly reasonable and, and hasn't been, been entirely uh, uh, 
answered so far. Um, there, there is concerns with the transition process. I think it's only, only realistic to, to say that is the case. And, uh, Lord Morrow and, and many others have uh, highlighted that this issue uh, over the, the course of, of this, this Assembly term. We do have a situation where, um, whenever people are leaving school, there is a perception that they are falling off a cliff, where they're moving from the, the, the security and certainty of the school environment to a much more uncertain world, where there is a mixture of provision, whether it's in terms of day centres provided through uh, the health and social services, uh, whether it's uh, the further education colleges, support from the community voluntary sector, uh, resource through the, the European uh, Social Fund, or indeed what are in practice gaps. Um, that, uh, one of the reasons that um, we have this interministerial group uh, under the, uh, the executive's um, mental health and learning disability um, subgroup is to try to, to, to better map out the different interventions that departments can bring to the table. Certainly my department has major responsibilities in this regard, but also um, health education, uh, DRD, amongst others, have key, key responsibilities as well. So we are looking for a partnership approach uh, to addressing this issue. Again, to, to be realistic, um, we are somewhat hampered uh, in terms of the lack of available resources, given the, the, the pressure that we're finding on, on budgets. Um, and at this stage, probably most of those actions are going to be focused around better coordination and information to ensure that existing provision is being fully uh, utilised and people are, are fully aware of the opportunities that do exist. Um, my department provides a, a range of services that help remove barriers to employment for people with disabilities, including those with a sensory impairment or disability. A special advice and guidance is provided by careers advisors working in partnership with colleagues from the employment service in order to agree upon the most suitable provision that will help people overcome their respective disability related barriers to work. My department provides additional and special support as well as significant funding to enable access and participation in pre-employment programmes such as training for success and the further and higher education courses available throughout Northern Ireland. With regard to specific employment interventions, my department's Disability Employment Service manages and delivers a number of high-quality pre-employment and in-work support programmes that are helping more than 2,000 people with, with disabilities, including those who are blind or deaf, to find and sustain paid employment each year. These programmes include access to work, Workable, WorkConnect and the Condition Management Programme. The department has a dedicated occupational psychology service which provides employment assessments for employers and disabled people, including those with sensory disabilities. The department also provides funding to a number of organisations who are supporting people who are blind, partially sighted or deaf through a range of training and employment projects under the European Social Fund Disability Strand. Officials have been working in partnership with local disability sector representatives on the development of a new employment and skills strategy for people with disabilities. A draft strategy, including a range of, of proposals, is due to be issued for public consultation over the coming months. The purpose of the strategy will be to improve the skills, employability, job prospects and careers of people with a full range of disabilities throughout Northern Ireland. Um, I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. I can ask the Minister if his department is aware or, or even exploring international best practice uh, as to how such barriers to employment can be overcome. Uh, yes, I'm happy to confirm to the member that is indeed the case, and uh, the, the, the work that has been undertaken in relation to the, the development to date around the, the new strategy it has been informed by uh, some international examples and, and best practice. So certainly we're very keen to learn from how things are, are, are done in other, uh, other societies. And uh, if you look at our work on apprenticeships and youth training, you, you'll also see that type of approach in action. Mr. Fergal McKinney. I thank the Minister for the detail in his, his answer. Uh, but could he. Uh, oh, apologies. apologies. Um, could the Minister outline whether he believes there are sufficient incentives for employers to afford any adaptations necessary in order to uh, employ partially sighted blind people from the deaf community as well? 
Well, um, the issue of um, incentives and, and uh, resourcing is, is something that is a feature of some of our existing programmes, such as uh, um, ac um, access to work uh, and, uh, and, and workable. And uh, we are keen to, to ensure that those are being used as effectively uh, as they can. Um, but uh, th this is an issue about more than simply uh, providing the, the infrastructure uh, to, to ensure that uh, people with disabilities can flourish, flourish in the workplace. It's about actually uh, tackling attitudes uh, from, from employers and rather than seeing a situation where the employment of someone with, with a disability is somehow a, an inconvenience or, or, or a burden, it's how we actually uh, ensure that people understand that this is about uh, equality in the workplace and actually recognising that often uh, people with disabilities are, are more dedicated uh, to, to their workplace and indeed more productive uh, than many of their, of, their, of their peers and to ensure that we can really uh, attract the, the fullest uh, and draw upon the fullest pool of talent available to society. Ms. Anna Lowe. Question three, please. Thank you. In June 2014, uh, I published uh, Securing Our Success, the Northern Ireland Strategy on Apprenticeships. The strategy provides an opportunity to facilitate economic and social progress and will be key in transforming our skills landscape and in securing our economic success. My department is currently piloting higher-level apprenticeships across a number of sectors with the aim of testing their effectiveness to meet the specific skill needs of local employers. Higher-level apprenticeship pilot projects are currently in progress in sectors including engineering, ICT, accountancy, life sciences and professional services. At present, 130 higher-level apprentices are employed across 46 companies. Employers currently involved in the higher level apprenticeship pilot projects include PwC, Deloitte, Norbrook, Terex and Moy Park. As part of my department's successful change fund bid, uh, we intend to take forward further higher level apprenticeship pilots over the next 12 months. Officials from my department have been working closely with colleagues from universities and FE colleges to raise the profile of higher level apprenticeships and to encourage the development of proposals for further pilots. I anticipate that approximately 400 uh, new higher level apprenticeship places will be available from September 2015 and I look forward to making further announcements regarding individual apprenticeship opportunities over the coming months. Ms. Anna Lowe for some. Thank you uh, Mr Speaker, certainly that's very much uh, to be welcome. I think higher level apprenticeships are uh, very much uh, value. I think by, by young people, and instead of going to universities, you know, they, they appreciate the opportunities. Can I ask the minister, how is he going to uh, identify um, new opportunities uh, then for the, um, for the higher level apprenticeships? Well, essentially there's a, a twin track process in place around uh, identifying um, new, new opportunities and at the heart uh, li lies the employer. It's the employer that will shape where opportunities lie in terms uh, of, of the job market and let's bear in mind of course that apprenticeships are actual jobs, albeit jobs in which people are on a, on a training uh, contract. Um, we have a, a number of sector partnerships emerging under, under the strategy and they're taking almost a top-down approach, working with colleges and, and employers and, and sector skills councils uh, where appropriate to, to map out where new opportunities uh, can, can arise. At the same time, uh, a lot of our colleges and universities are voting with their feet and going out and creating new opportunities from the, from the bottom up uh, and uh, they have some very direct responsibilities for engaging uh, with employers and seeing where emerging opportunities uh, are, 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 are developing. So between those two approaches, uh, we are uh, rolling out a, a quite a considerable number of new opportunities. And uh, if anything, um, we're probably being, being uh, uh, really encouraged by the, the, the energy that's coming forward and the interest that we're seeing from all of the different stakeholders and what is a, a very uh, new but an innovative approach to, to providing skills for the local economy. And I call Mr Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome the Minister's statement and, and indeed congratulate him on his efforts in trying to get higher level apprenticeships working. Can the Minister assure the House and indeed the industry in Northern Ireland that the need for fabrication engineers and technician based engineering will be met through these apprenticeships eventually, given that many employers are having to rely on skilled technical people from Poland, Latvia and other East European states? 
Um, well, I am happy to, to, to give the member the encouragement uh, in, in, in this regard, in that um, a, the, the development of apprenticeships is to be driven by employers and where skilled vacancies uh, exist. So if there is a particular problem in terms of fabrication and engineering, um, through partnership uh, with perhaps the, uh, the South West College in terms of the, the members' uh, particular uh, consistency interest, uh, we can see uh, the, the emergence of that type uh, of, of apprenticeship. Uh, employers can feel free to approach South West College uh, with a view to, to seeing if a higher, higher level apprenticeship uh, can be developed in, in, that, in that particular area. And uh, I will certainly uh, encourage those type of conversations to, to take place. Under, over then. And I thank the Minister for that uh, information. And I note some of the, the large companies that the Minister uh, mentioned in his, in his first answer there. When the, first, when the Minister first floated uh, this, uh, this matter, uh, he indicated that there may be need for incentives for employers uh, to support higher level apprentices. Is this still an option to encourage small businesses to take apprentices? Uh, yes, very much so. And uh, I think by way of, of, of context, it's important to recognise that in virtually every jurisdiction, we see a situation where it is disproportionately the bigger employers who are more actively engaged in the apprenticeship form of, of training. And this is the case in many of the Germanic countries and Scandinavian countries. Uh, and often small uh, and medium-sized enterprises uh, maybe see uh, obstacles in their way or they maybe don't see that they have the, the, the scale uh, to, to support uh, training. Uh, I am very clear that uh, in all contexts, uh, apprenticeship training is, is relevant uh, to, to businesses and everyone should consider it. But given the need to uh, encourage, in particular, SMEs uh, to engage, we are looking at a number uh, of different approaches, uh, whether it is uh, shared training or whether it is uh, some degree of, of financial incentive. Uh, work is currently underway in that regard. As the member will appreciate, there is an action plan uh, attached uh, to the strategy as we roll it out uh, over the next, uh, next year to the full rollout in, in September 2016. And that issue about uh, financing and incentives is one of the, 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 the projects uh, within that action plan. Again, it comes to George Robinson. Mr. Speaker. Um, one of the key groups that are enabling uh, success will seek to help are people with work-limiting health conditions or disabilities who, with appropriate support and accommodations from an employer, should be able to work. The strategy will directly seek to support this group towards and into the labour market through a series of voluntary interventions which will be delivered through the following projects. Project A, which will develop an outcomes framework through a co-design approach with key stakeholders to inform a competitive pilot testing process. Project B, which will develop a, a regime of competitive pilots to test the effectiveness of a number of small-scale initiatives in improving outcomes for people in the target groups. Project C, which will deliver and evaluate a control group uh, pilot for people with work-limiting health conditions or disabilities. Uh, Project D, which will help to develop targeted support and incentives to encourage employers to hire and upskill people from the target groups. Project E, which will put in place new measures to, to promote the financial advantages of employment, raise awareness levels of transitional benefits protection, and better communicate the rules on how to reclaim benefits to encourage transitions to the labour market. The strategy will work alongside existing disability service provision, such as the Job Introduction Scheme and the Condition Management Programme through my department's Disability Employment Service. In addition, the department is currently finalising the, the new Disability Employment Strategy for Northern Ireland. This aims to cover the entire journey from full-time education through to paid employment for people with, with a significant disability-related labour market barriers. The strategy will target people of all ages, but will have a focus on young people who are participating in education, training and pre-employment programmes who require additional and longer-term support. Mr Robinson, for his supplement. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answer. Despite support, would the Minister undertake to explore the reasons why some people with hidden disabilities find the transition to economic uh, activity problematic? Uh, very much so. I mean, um, the economic and activity uh, strategy um, has identified that um, there is a considerable number of people uh, with uh, dis disabilities um, who have either ruled themselves out or been ruled out from the, the, from the labour market. 
Uh, however, we assess that there are a considerable number of those who do have the capacity to engage in, in some, some degree of work, and many of, of them uh, would benefit either from some direct support or uh, incentives to, to encourage them uh, back into the labour market. Um, that pool would be much bigger than the, 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 uh, the, 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 the target group for the disability employment strategy uh, directly, and that in, 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 in a sense reflects the fact that a lot of disability can be hidden uh, within, within society, but it's no less uh, challenging um, in terms of participation in, in the world of work, and hopefully a number of the new uh, competitive pilots that we develop will try to address that particular issue. Well, Mr. John Callister. I'm grateful, Mr. Speaker. Um, could I ask the minister if he could detail the exact funding available to this enabling success strategy, and particularly the funding available to, to that part of it dealing with learning disabilities? Would he agree with me that if it is an unfunded strategy, it, it could well do little to help those economically uh, inactive and become an, in danger of becoming another unfulfilled executive promise? Well, uh, the issue of, of funding uh, largely falls into the, the forthcoming uh, financial year in terms of the 16-17 uh, financial year. We are we're looking to the initial rollout of the, the strategy over the, the coming months. Uh, there was a successful bid to the change fund by the Department of Social Development, uh, which will uh, seek to, to, to commence uh, one, one of the, the pilots. In terms of fi financing for this financial year, we will we'll be looking to bids for the monitoring round uh, to enable uh, work to commence on a number of strands. But bearing in mind this is an executive strategy, it is also something that, uh, right across all the political parties, we are very conscious of the need to ensure that we begin to address what is a major structural problem within our economy. Uh, I would be uh, encouraged uh, by the prospects uh, of that money coming forward during the course of this year, and then uh, a, a full budget line being provided, not just to my department, but indeed others, uh, for the, the, the forthcoming financial year in 2016 and 17. Thank you. And I call Mr. Pat um, Mr. Speaker, uh, with your permission, I wish to group uh, questions 5, 6, 7 and 9, and potentially 8 and 11 as well, uh, if the members had been here. I would like to request an additional minute uh, for the, the answer. The European Social Fund is an open and competitive funding programme. Following the conclusion of the most recent application assessment process, the Department has offered funding to 68 applicants. This funding equates to over £112.6 million for the first three years of a seven-year programme. Organisations will receive contributions in the form of 40% from the European Commission, 25% from Dell and 35% from private or public sector match funding. At £180 million worth of applications were originally submitted to the programme and it was inevitable that the Department could not fund all applications. Although a number of, appl of applicants scored above the quality threshold, there was insufficient funding to offer all those uh, applicants funding. For organisations indicating that they will deliver provision in West Belfast, seven applicants have been offered funding within the youth priority, eight applicants in the unemployed inactive priority, and nine applicants in the disability priority. Sixty of the, of the successful applicants overall were from the, the voluntary and community sector, with the remaining applicants coming from the statutory or private sectors. Funding to the community and voluntary sector equates to approximately 92 per cent of the total offered. The new, uh, the new programme aims to further drive up skill levels, and this investment in projects across Northern Ireland will provide opportunities to people who face the greatest barriers to work and learning. The funding will help individuals fulfil their potential by giving them better skills and better job prospects to, to take steps towards employment. Specifically, the programme will support over uh, 10,000 young people not in education, employment or training, 24,700 uh, participants who are unemployed or inactive, and over 7,200 people with a disability. Additionally, the programme will provide assistance to over 2,300 uh, 2, families. Despite a challenging uh, process and time frame, the Department has been able to complete the ESF assessment process to allow funding to be offered from the 1st of April. Thank you. And I call Mr Sheehan for a supplement. I ask Dr Agra. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, and I'm sure the Minister is aware that West Belfast as one of the most socially and economically depraved and disadvantaged constituencies anywhere in these islands. Uh, and it's a body blow to the constituency to have lost 
for these organisations to have lost their funding. I'm wondering, is the minister, or can the minister do anything to ensure that the essential services that were being provided by these groups are not lost to West Belfast? And would he give a commitment to meet some of those groups that have lost their funding? Kermayla. Well, first of all, I'm happy to, to meet uh, with, with, with groups who, who wish to discuss the outcome uh, of, of the process. Um, but let me be clear, as I did in the original answer, um, we have listed a, a large number of projects that will be working within the West Belfast uh, constituency. And whenever the member talks about organisations who have lost their funding, it is important uh, that he and indeed that the House bears in mind that this is an unopened and competitive process. Uh, while groups went into this who may well have been pre in with that pre-existing funding under the fund, there is no guarantee, or, nor indeed should anyone have an expectation of continued funding and what is a competitive process. All organisations were judged uh, on, on their merits. Um, I am satisfied that we have a reasonable geographical balance across Northern Ireland, including West Belfast, and indeed factoring in the degree of deprivation that occurs in, in that particular area compared to, to some other parts of, of Northern Ireland. So while we can't guarantee an outcome for particular organisations, I think overall we have to recognise that the, the, the programme has delivered, and we are talking about an expanded programme over the next seven years compared to what happened previously. So not, we're not talking about cuts here, we're talking about more money being spent through the different strands of the funds. But what we can't guarantee and manage is that particular organisations will be winners compared to others and what is a process that is judged on merit of the applications coming forward. Can I call uh, Ms Karen McKevitt? I'm on a time difficulty here. I'm just wondering if uh, the Minister can indicate where suitable a written answer. Uh, I'm, I'm conscious that four questions have been grouped and, and the individuals have been sitting very patiently. Is that if you would indicate what way you wish to answer, and I'm wasting more time sure, than I okay. have. Deputy Speaker, uh, would the Minister have accurate figures for the number of people who lost employment as a result of unsuccessful applications to the ESF programme? Um. I wouldn't be able to give those figures. Those are figures for the individual organisations themselves. They could be collated in terms of various HR or one forms that may come through in terms of redundancies. But also, some organisations may be doing different work as well. So it's not entirely clean to disaggregate from that exactly what are job losses from from the fund. But again, I would stress where we have an unfortunate situation that some organisations lose money and uh, staff are, are lost equally. There are jobs being created in other organisations elsewhere in the community and voluntary sector because we have an expanded fund that we are seeing different organisations taking forward projects than maybe what was the, the case under the previous round. It's the members who didn't get a chance. Uh, that yeah. took longer than I could afford. And that ends the period for listed questions and we now move on to topicals. And I call Mr George Robinson. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I should say, <laughs> uh, has the minister any plans um, uh, to hold parents' evenings in, or uh, sorry, educational parents' evenings in my East Londonderry <coughs> constituency, as in Oma, Ballymena, and uh, Londonderry? I, I missed, the, missed the question. Could you repeat the question? Yes. Has the minister any plans to hold educational? Evenings in uh, my East Londonderry constituency, as in Oma, Londonderry. Well, uh, I'm not entirely clear what the member means by ed educational evenings. Uh, I know uh, over the next uh, number of weeks we're, we're running a number of careers events um, in which we're involving parents around the, import the importance uh, of uh, good careers advice and the opportunities uh, that, that exist. Um, certainly, they will, they're occurring in a, a number of, of particular points across Northern Ireland. But if that's what the member is, is, uh, is uh, asking, um, we're certainly happy to review the, the uh, success or otherwise of that initiative and to see if we can expand it to other parts of Northern Ireland, including the members' own constituency. Thank, thanks very much for that answer. Um, there may be some parents who have got um, transport problems. Would there be any chance of having a word maybe with uh, Mr Kennedy to see if transport could be provided? As long as Mr Kennedy is paying, I am happy to raise the issue with him. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister uh, whether he has sought to engage with trade unions and employers on the issue of zero hour contracts, given the differing views submitted through the recent public consultation? Mm -hmm. 
Um, yes, I mean, I, I've had uh, engagement with uh, trade unions around a whole range uh, of different aspects uh, of employment law. Uh, the member will appreciate that we have um, a bill that has been uh, drafted, uh, which hopefully we'll, we should get approval from the executive shortly to introduce. Uh, plus, we've also got a, a paper uh, with the executive um, for which we're awaiting approval uh, to enable us to take forward a range of legislative interventions to regulate zero hours contracts uh, in, in Northern Ireland. And uh, I would uh, like to think that would be signed off by the executive in the very near future. for some. Um, I thank you and I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, could I ask the Minister, would he agree with me that the focus of ending zero hour contracts should primarily be on large multi multinational companies who do not face the same difficulties as smaller local enterprises? Well, uh, we are we doing some work in terms of mapping um, the use of zero hours contracts in Northern Ireland. And uh, not every company or organisation would be engaging with them. And indeed, um, when zero hours contracts are deployed, um, they will be in, in a range of different settings. And uh, the, the uh, attitudes of people to them will be, will be different uh, depending upon their own personal uh, circumstances. They are more pre prevalent, for example, in the tourism and hospitality sector and uh, health and social care. We're not seeing a situation where they're more prevalent in large businesses compared to, to small businesses. If anything, uh, SMEs would depend more upon the flexibility that from the, employer's, from the employer's perspective that comes from a zero hours contract. Um, ho hopefully, whenever this actually does come before the Assembly, we can have those proper full discussions around the issue. And I would certainly encourage the member to speak to her ministers and the executive uh, to ensure we can actually get things moving so we can actually get the thing into the Assembly and have a proper discussion on the matter. Going to come, Sir Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Obviously, with the significant budget reduction within the Department of Employment and Learning, I'm wondering if uh, the Minister has given any consideration to trying to reduce the number of potential compulsory redundancies, if any, and can he give us any update if there will be compulsory redundancies at all? Well, again, can I uh, first of all congratulate the Member on his election to, par to Parliament last week. Um, in terms of the issue of uh, compulsory uh, redundancies, it's certainly something I I'm very keen to avoid, and, but, but we should raise the issue in, in this context. First of all, in terms of departmental um, uh, job reductions, that is based entirely through uh, the voluntary um, ex exit scheme. We are uh, conscious, however, that we do fund our colleges and universities. We're in an advanced situation with a particular uh, voluntary exit scheme for the further education uh, sector. Again, that's based upon uh, vo voluntary exit. The situation in terms of universities is, is, a, is of a slightly different nature in terms of their uh, relationship with the department. But again, I would be hopeful that we that they would uh, address the, the very necessary and unfortunate uh, issue of, of, of staffing uh, through means other than compulsory redundancies. Brilliant for supplement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for that and also for his good wishes. Um, could I ask him if he has given any, any thought to the protection of jobs in the regional colleges, particularly in the South West Regional College, where obviously there is a lot of progressive uh, work ongoing with local businesses, and uh, so that any redundancies are, are minimised? Well, as I would like to, to answer in the affirmative to, to the member, I mean, it's simply not possible to give that type of, of assurance. I mean, we are facing what are extremely difficult and challenging cuts across all of my uh, department's uh, service areas, and that includes the, the further education uh, colleges. Uh, what I can say is that we are trying to be as strategic as we can in terms of how, of how we approach things, and also in terms of the future work of colleges themselves. They will want to ensure that, consistent with the emerging uh, further education strategy, that they are able to focus their resources, including staffing, on areas that are most relevant to the economic development uh, of Northern Ireland and also the particular areas that they service. Thank you, and I call Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to uh, follow my, my party colleague, uh, the Minister. So congratulations to Tom Elliott on his uh, success in the recent sure. elections, too. Um, can I ask the Minister, what impact is the return of the Conservative government likely to have on the work of his department? 
I thank the member for um, that, that question. And, um, I suppose on the subject of congratulations, we first of all should congratulate David Cameron and his colleagues on their, on their return uh, before, before we turn to slate them in terms of the impact uh, of a number of their uh, decisions. Um, I think for all of us, I think we have immediate concerns about the impact uh, of uh, what may be deeper spending cuts upon the Northern Ireland uh, block grant, as well as the impact on the rest of the UK uh, as well, and the, the, the uh, implications that will arise from that for investments uh, in, in skills. Um, I do note that while we are seeing an, an overall economic recovery across the, the UK, it is one that features relatively low productivity still, and the best way of addressing productivity is through investment in skills. So there's a, a very strong imperative across the UK as a whole to continue in, investing in skills. Um, there may well be some opportunities uh, from uh, new approaches around, for example, tax incentives for employers around uh, apprenticeships or indeed other funding schemes that we may be able to, dr to draw upon. Um, equally, I am concerned about however, uh, what could become a much more radical approach to employment law uh, matters um, in terms of, of deregulation of, of employment law. Uh, and, uh, that will be out of keeping with the approach that we take in Northern Ireland, where we do, do try to balance the interests of employees and employers and to create a, a more harmonious uh, approach. Um, there are also issues that I am concerned about as well in relation to uh, the, the approach that has been taken around uh, immigration. Um, we are very keen to, to ensure that we can attract students uh, from overseas to our colleges and also that we are able to retain them uh, within, their, within our economy. Uh, and that, that economic rationale I think, has been rather undercut by uh, the approach that's, that has been taken to date by the UK Government around immigration issues. And I fear that may well uh, get worse uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the immediate future. Nicole, Ms. Anilou, for Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I certainly share the Minister's concern about the immigration restrictions on uh, foreign students, and I am aware of the university uh, intake of students overseas certainly have dropped in recent years because of the restriction uh, by, by Westminster. Can I ask the Minister what, what power we have here in Northern Ireland? to mitigate these restrictions? Well, um, I'm certainly happy to continue making uh, representations uh, to um, the, the Home Office and indeed others um, in this regard. I know our universities feel very strongly about the issue, um, as do universities elsewhere in the UK. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And we have a situation where we have two narratives that are cutting across each other, one based upon a tougher immigration policy and one about economic uh, growth. And certainly I want to focus on the economic growth aspect. In a similar vein, the, the potential withdrawal from the European Union that's now on the cards, I think would have a very dramatic impact on Northern Ireland um, in a very general sense in terms of our economy um, and also uh, the financing we, we receive from, from Europe through, for example, the European uh, Social Fund and also the, the very specific support that we receive, for, for example, through things like um, uh, the, the, peace, the peace monies. Uh, so that's something I think we need to be very mindful of uh, as well. In terms of other mitigating things, I think we, we do need to continue paying regard to what's happening in Great Britain around employment law, but, but continue to use use devolution to find local solutions that carry support acro across uh, the, the community. Um, on a more encouraging note, we have in the past had good co uh, cooperation between the skills ministers in the four different nations, and I would like to think that under the new administration that type of collaborative approach uh, will continue around uh, skills and qualifications issues. Thank you. And Mr Tom Buchanan is not in this place. I call Mr Sidney Anderson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, following the recent appointment of Mr Mark Huddleston as the new Northern Ireland uh, Commissioner for Employment and Skills, can I ask what plans you and uh, your officials have to work with the UK Commission in order to maximise our skills potential? Well, we, we, we work with the, the Commission uh, on, uh, an on an ongoing basis. I mean, Mark Huddleston is, is, is a, someone who is appointed by me uh, to fulfil uh, an, an important role uh, on behalf of, of both the Department and indeed um, uh, Northern Ireland. The Commission itself has, undertaken, um, a, has undergone a major review uh, by the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills in recent years, and it, its, its remit has been endorsed, but also at the same time narrowed a bit more about research and advocacy issues rather than direct. Uh, 
uh, service uh, delivery. But it's important that, in, in particular, we learn lessons from what's happening in other jurisdictions and take advantage of that research base. While I'm on the subject, I can also then uh, pay tribute, in particular, to uh, Bill McGuinness, uh, who was the, the outgoing uh, Northern Ireland uh, Skills uh, Commissioner and also the, the Northern Ireland Skills Advisor for the sterling work that he's done over the past number of years on behalf of, of Northern Ireland. Um, most recently, obviously, in that particular role, but also through a whole range of other um, public service aspects. Uh, I thank the Minister for that response. And, uh, Minister, in view of the key importance of skills and innovation uh, to our economy, can I ask what other steps you are currently taking to ensure the development of an appropriately skilled workforce? Um, I, I can. I, I imagine I would incur the wrath of the Speaker by going on, going on for about half an hour in terms of setting out virtually everything that we do as a department. But let me just say briefly that uh, the department as a whole is, is focused entirely about investing in skills and bringing pe people closer to the labour market, whether it's through apprenticeships, youth training, what we do through the colleges and through um, higher education or, or, or uh, universities. It's all about um, making our economy much more efficient, uh, having a better matching of supply and, and demand and ensuring we have more higher level skills, a stronger footprint in terms of STEM subjects. I call Mr Jim Alistair. Could I ask the Minister, is he satisfied that in this age when transparency is expected, that within the university sector it is acceptable that maladministration is investigated by visitors appointed by the university and indeed remunerated by the university. And would it not be far preferable that that uh, provision in its whole, not just for students, should pass to the new ombudsperson? Well, obviously, first of all, the universities themselves uh, are not directly run by the department. Um, we are a primary funder of them, and we can develop a higher education strategy. Uh, that particular topic around um, investigations around complaints of maladministration is something that is certainly uh, something that is worth uh, considering, and no doubt, as the the, uh, the legislation being brought forward by the OFM DFM committee uh, progresses, it's something that will be discussed by the House in, in much greater depth uh, over the coming weeks. Sir Alistair, first up. Well, would the minister be supportive of an amendment to widen the scope of the bill? to include not just complaints by students, but also by employees within universities. Well, we need to see what the actual text of the amendment uh, would say before we can reach a judgment uh, on whether we would support it or not. I'm going to call Cahill O'Hashi. Can, uh, can I ask the Minister whether he's confident that he can implement any changes to the way in which students are paid uh, their support funds and loan instalments before the end of uh, this Assembly mandate? Well, I think I've said in response to a number of members that we are, in principle, happy to uh, take forward a consultation. In that regard, I appreciate the arguments that have been made for it. Uh, there are some contrary arguments in terms of uh, administration and also um, the ability of students uh, to spend money up front in terms of some costs that they, that they face. So th the, there's two opposing viewpoints that need to be uh, considered, but we're certainly happy to test it as part of a consultation, and if appropriate, and if the time permits, then yes, we will look to to deliver change within this mandate. And thank you, Minister. And time is up. And we'll return to the debate. If the House will take its ease, we'll be changed to the top table.